Good evening. I am Ernesto Cedillo of uh, Yale University and also member of the Foundation Board of the World Economic uh, Forum. Welcome uh, to this uh, session on the United Nations. I think most of you uh, would agree that our world would be a uh, much uh, or a much less prosperous place and a more dangerous place if we didn't have a multilateral system, a multilateral system that uh, started to be created in its present form after the Second World War. But I think also most of you will agree that that system is outdated. It is not up to the challenges that humanity is facing at the beginning of this century. And one of the persons that has been uh, more vocal about uh, this uh, insufficiency of the multilateral system is the United Nations Secretary General himself. He, two and a half years ago, in a celebrated uh, but also dramatic speech, he said something like, we have reached uh, uh, a fork in the road. We have to reform the system. And a year ago, with a view towards the World Summit that was and took place in September uh, of 2005, he said that this was once in a generation opportunity to reform the system. The World Summit uh, took place, some uh, agreements were taken, others were not taken. Uh, and the outcome of that summit, of course, is very important for the whole world, for peace, for security, for development, for human rights. So it is very important for the World Economic Forum to receive uh, today uh, to Mr. Secretary General, who will give uh, his remarks on uh, the present and the future of the United Nations. Please, let's welcome Mr. Kofi Annan. Thank you very much, uh, Ernesto. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and dear friends. Some of you may remember me coming here to Davos nine years ago as a freshly minted Secretary General. Since then, I have attended all but three of the annual meetings, including the memorable, memorable one in 2002, when you came to show confidence in New York after the attack on the World Trade Center. So I did not hesitate one minute when Klaus asked me to speak on the topic, uh, a new mindset for the United Nations. And of course, it was an interesting topic as I begin my final year in office. And why? Because it expresses something I have been trying to achieve I've striven to achieve throughout these nine years, and something in which Davos itself played a part. In 1999, I came here and called for a global compact between the United Nations and the private sector. Many of my colleagues in the Secretariat and many of the representatives of member states would hardly have been more shocked if I had proposed a compact with the devil. It is that mindset that I have been seeking to change throughout my time in office. The mindset that sees international relations as nothing more than relations between states and the United Nations a little more than a trade union of governments. My objective has been to persuade both the member states and my colleagues in the Secretariat 
that the United Nations needs to engage not only with governments, but with people. Only if it does that, I believe, can it fulfill its vocation and be of use to humanity in the 21st century. That was why, in the year 2000, I used the first words of the charter, We the Peoples, as the title of my report, setting out the agenda for the Millennium Summit at which political leaders from all over the world came together to assess the challenges of a new century and adopted a collective response known as the Millennium Declaration. And that was why last year, in my report called In Larger Freedom, I, used gov <coughs> I urged governments to accept that security and development are interdependent and that neither can be long sustained without respect for human rights and the rule of law. That report was intended as the blueprint not only for a far-reaching reform of the United Nations, but also for a series of decisions that would enable humanity to realize the aims of the Millennium Declaration, particularly in the light of new challenges that had arisen since. How far the blueprint will be translated into reality remains to be seen. But in the meantime, the United Nations has not stood still. Far from it, this has been a decade of rapid change. Let me give you a few examples. When I took office, there was widespread perception based on the tragic events in Bosnia, Somalia, and Rwanda that UN peacekeeping was a failed experiment and that henceforth this task would have to be handled by regional organizations. Peacekeepers, especially in countries where conflicts were still raging, where there was literally no peace to keep, continue to face immense challenges. Even so, today we have 85,000 people serving in 16 UN peacekeeping operations spread across four continents. Most of these operations are not static observers of truce, but active participants in the implementation of peace agreements, helping the people of war-torn countries make the transition from war to peace. Certainly, in many parts of the world, regional organizations play an important role, and so they should. But most often, they do so in partnership with the United Nations. The UN has become, in effect, the indispensable mechanism for bringing international help to countries recovering from conflict, and member states have now recognized this by agreeing to set up a peace-building commission within the UN to manage this highly complex process. The last decade has also seen growing number and growing use of UN economic sanctions. These are now used to influence or restrict the activity not only of recalcitrant states, but also of non-state actors, such as rebel movements or terrorist groups. At the same time, the Security Council has developed more sophisticated and humane types of sanctions aimed at individuals rather than societies uh, as a whole, travel bans, for instance, and the freezing of bank accounts. The same philosophy of punishing individuals rather than communities has driven the work of the UN criminal tribunals for Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia, one of which was the first international court to convict people of genocide, including a former prime minister, and of rape as a war crime, while the other has become the first to indict and try a former head of state. This in turn has led to further innovations, including the mixed tribunal in Sierra Leone and of course the International Criminal Court. The latter is not an organ of the United Nations, 
but the United Nations convened and serviced the conference that adopted its statute in 1998. Over 100 member states have now ratified the statute, which means that the court's jurisdiction is now recognized by well over half of the United Nations membership. Another way the UN has changed is the increasing focus on human rights, which is reflected in the recent decision by member states to strengthen the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And that office is now a dynamic operational entity which employs and supports hundreds of human rights workers around the world. And I hope that within the next week or two, we may see agreement on a corresponding change at the intergovernmental level with the establishment of a more authoritative Human Rights Council to replace the now widely discredited Commission. One more example of change. The United Nations has responded to the growth of international terrorism. Even before 9-11, the Security Council had imposed sanctions on Al-Qaeda and set up a special committee to monitor its activities. Immediately after the attack, the Council went even further, much further, with its historic res resolution 1373, which imposed stringent obligations on all countries, established a list of terrorist organizations and individuals, and created the Counterterrorism Committee to monitor member states' compliance and help them improve their capacity to enact and implement anti-terrorist legislation. In short, I believe the United Nations is proving itself an increasingly flexible instrument to which its member states turn for a wider and wider array of functions. For instance, within the last five years, the UN has been asked to shepherd Afghanistan's transition from the anarchic wasteland of the Taliban and the warlords to a nascent democracy, still struggling, but hopeful that it is today. We've been asked to help establish the interim government of Iraq and help organize the referendum and elections there, and we have supported the Constitution uh, writing. And we supported the whole series of elections that has taken place in about over 120 countries over the last 12 years. And we have been asked, and we've done it, to verify the withdrawal of Syrian troops from Lebanon and carry out for the first time ever a full criminal investigation into the assassination of a former prime minister. And we have also been asked to coordinate global relief efforts after the tsunami and again after the earthquake in Kashmir. And to take the lead in raising global awareness as well as funds to protect the world's people against the avian flu. What all these activities have in common is that they involve the United Nations not simply in relations amongst its member states, but also in the lives of their peoples. To carry out such tasks, we must engage not only with governments, but with all the new actors on the international scene. That includes the private sector, but, also in, but it also includes parliamentarians, voluntary non-for-profit organizations, philanthropic foundations, the global media, celebrities from the worlds of sports and entertainment, and in some cases, labor unions, mayors, and local administrators. And it includes, I must, alas, say, less benign actors such as terrorists, warlords, and traffickers in drug, illicit weapons, or worst of all, the lives and bodies of human beings. And that is why I have repeatedly urged all the organs of the United Nations to be more open to civil society so that their decisions can fully reflect the contribution made by groups and individuals 
who would devote themselves to studying specific problems or working in specific areas. It is also why I myself have cultivated contacts with scholars, with parliamentarians, and with practitioners of all sorts, and with young people seeking to learn from their views and also to encourage them, whatever sector they work in, to use their talents for the public good and to keep the global horizon in view. It is not one of the reasons, it is one of the reasons why I have worked constantly to make our organization transparent, comprehensible to the public, and thereby more genuinely accountable. And of course, it is why I launched the Global Compact to which international business community, including some of you in this audience, has responded with such enthusiasm that it is now the world's leading corporate citizenship initiative involving more than 2,400 companies in nearly 90 countries. This new mindset must extend to the domain of international peace and security so that we think of security not only in conventional terms, focusing on prevention of war between states, but also as including the protect, protection of the world's peoples against threats which to many of them today seem more immediate and more real. One of those threats is the threat of genocide and other crimes against humanity. I called, on the General I called the General Assembly's attention to this in 1999, warning that such atrocities can never be treated as purely domestic affair. And governments should not be allowed to hide behind the shield of sovereignty to brutalize their own people. Being rightly called crimes against humanity, they demand collective response from humanity, which should be organized and legitimized by the United Nations. More recently, the high-level panel that I appointed in 2003 has identified a broad range of threats which member states have more or less accepted. And these include poverty, infectious disease, and environmental degradation, conflict within states as well as between them, the spread of nuclear, radiological, chemical, and biological weapons, terrorism, and transnational crime. My Larger Freedom Report, built on this definition, on this broader definition of global security, drawing it together with the detailed recommendation of the Millennium Project for achieving the Millennium Development Goals by 2015, which in itself would rescue many millions of people from the threats of poverty and disease. But my report also included a third dimension, human rights and the rule of law. Without these, any society, however well armed, will remain insecure, and this development, however dynamic, will remain precarious. Member States took their report as their starting point in negotiating the outcome document of last summer's summit. I wouldn't say that the document fulfilled all my hopes, but it does contain many important decisions. From the creation of a peace building commission and a human rights council, through commitments to advance the Millennium Development Goals, to the acceptance by all states individually and collectively of the responsibility to protect populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. <clears throat> Dear friends, the United Nations cannot stand still because the threats to humanity do not stand still. Every day, the world presents challenges, 
which the founders of the UN 60 years ago could never have anticipated. Whether it is looming crisis over Iran and its compliance with nuclear non-proliferation treaty, continuing atrocities in Darfur, or the threat of an avian flu pandemic, people all over the world look to the United Nations to play a role in making peace, protecting civilians, improving livelihoods, promoting human rights, and upholding international law. I have worked long and hard to transform the United Nations so that when called upon, as we are every day, we will deliver what is asked of us effectively, efficiently, and equitably. That is the true objective of the changes I have sought to bring about, and it will be the true measure of my success or failure. My successor, since I understand several of the members of this panel may be interested in the position, <laughs> need not worry, need not worry. Changing the mindset of the United Nations so that it can both reflect and influence the temper of the times is a never-ending challenge. There will be plenty more work to do in the years and decades to come. Thank you very much. Please don't think that uh, we, did, we didn't prepare a chair for Mr. Secretary General. He just asked to go back to the people and be seated among the people. And now, dear friends, we move into the next stage of this session, our panel discussion. And we have very distinguished uh, panelists participating. Uh, we have uh, Minister Ban Ki-moon, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Korea, we have Ambassador Yajanta Danapala, a senior advisor to the president of Sri Lanka. We have uh, Mr. Rayat Gupta, senior partner of McKinsey, and a person that uh, just uh, like me, likes to do pro bono work for the United Nations from time to time. And uh, we are honored uh, with the presence of President Vaira Vic Freiberga, president of Latvia, and who was a special envoy of the Secretary General for the World Summit. So what I would do is uh, to ask uh, every one of our panelists to respond to uh, a question, uh, and that way we will hope to trigger a nice dialogue uh, and discussion. And I will follow the order that I was given uh, by the organizers. So, Mr. Minister Ban, it's true. The Secretary General got the Peace Building Commission, mm -hmm. the Human Rights Council, and I think the historic adoption of the responsibility to protect principle. I think those are enormous achievements uh, at the World Summit. However, if we compare that with uh, all the things that he proposed in his uh, in larger freedom agenda, I think uh, world leaders uh, really fell short of delivering on that ambitious agenda. So what went wrong? What uh, went right? <clears throat> uh, because some people think that uh, the final outcome relative to the need of reform <clears throat> Uh, was uh, a disappointment. Well, thank you very much for this first floor to be given to me. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to uh, express my deep admiration to uh, Secretary General Kofi Annan for his uh, remarks uh, outlining all uh, good examples and achievement he has made during his nine years of Secretary Generalship. Uh, as he just mentioned, uh, I'd like to see any successor, he or she, will be able to build upon 
uh, on its uh, very shining achievement and path uh, in the future. And having listened to Secretary General's uh, remarks, I'm very much proud as one of the long-standing United Nations men, uh, personally, that United Nations has been really a universal forum, primarily responsible for the maintenance of international peace and uh, security development assistance to uh, developing countries and fighting against international terrorism and also fighting uh, together uh, hand in hand to prevent the proliferation of weapons of mass destructions and also fighting against all these uh, new kinds of uh, challenges or pandemic uh, diseases, etc. These are all global challenges which the global organization, universal organization, United Nations, has to cope with together in close cooperation and commitment of the international community. Now, the Millennium Development Goal, as well as outcome document adopted by the leaders September uh, last year, outlines, gave us uh, very good guidelines to uh, develop assistance uh, programs as well as uh, fighting against international terrorism, in addition to uh, traditional challenges of this era to maintain peace and prosperity. Now, Secretary General mentioned about the uh, very good uh, achievement last year we made, the creation of a peace building commission and also agreement to establish P human rights council. In this regard, I think the concept the uh, res responsibility to protect, that will be an addition to a concept of Human Rights Council, expanding the horizon of the Human Rights Council, uh, which we have agreed. I hope that I hope that uh, member states will be able to agree on the details of the formation of Human Rights Council as soon as possible in the future. Now, we need to do more for the implementation of these MDG goals. Now, what went wrong, what is not uh, possible at this time is that I think uh, while the leaders have expressed their strong political will, the international community has not been able to maintain this generated momentum alive at this time. We still uh, need to work uh, more, and in this regard, we need to have a close cooperation, not only from the member state, but also from uh, uh, private sectors, public sectors, and also uh, civil uh, societies. The United Nations member state should feel the sense of shareholder, at the same time, stakeholders. I think we are both shareholders and stakeholders. There is a strong big stakes at hand. That is why the people say that United Nations is at a very critical uh, juncture. To overcome this uh, critical juncture and to make uh, United Nations a centerpiece of promoting, maintaining peace and security, and also giving uh, development assistance, as well as promoting human rights, which are three pillars of this organization, I think we need to work uh, very, uh, very hard to maintain this momentum alive with a strong political will demonstrated by the leaders last year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Ambassador Danapala, there are, I think, uh, 27,000 nuclear heads in the world, not all of them properly secure. There are hundreds of tons of nuclear fissile material spread in 40 countries. Uh, it is not hard to think what will happen if uh, an atomic uh, weapon is detonated in a city of any country. I think the disruption, not only economic, but uh, political, will be a tremendous disaster. And there are many other materials that could cause a tragedy. And yet, 
the summit outcome makes no reference to the question of disarmament and non-proliferation. Are we on the eve of seeing uh, President Kennedy's nightmare? You know, his nightmare was that in a few years there will be dozens of countries with nuclear weapons. What will it take for world leaders to take this matter more seriously and take the right decisions? Well, let me begin, uh, like uh, Minister Ban, by paying a warm tribute to Secretary General Kofi Annan for his splendid service to the international community, for his attempt to broaden the constituency of the United Nations, first the global compact here, but also to engage civil society in strengthening the United Nations. You are quite right to focus on a major lacuna in the outcome document of last September, the total absence of anything on disarmament, whether it is weapons of mass destruction, conventional weapons, or even small arms and light weapons. I think this reflects on a major absence of a consensus. Immediately after the Cold War ended, we had a unique opportunity of ensuring that weapons of mass destruction would be totally eliminated. However, that opportunity has not been seized, and uh, we have had, despite the indefinite extension of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and the successful 2000 Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference, a total failure last year of the review conference to adopt a final document. We have had the Conference on Disarmament, the sole multilateral negotiating body, unable even to adopt a work program. And so there has been a general paralysis with regard to achieving a consensus with regard to disarmament issues. And I think this stems from a fundamental inability to see that disarmament and non-proliferation are two faces of the same coin. It is impossible for us to argue a case for the retention of nuclear weapons by some countries and still preach the doctrine of non-proliferation. Because as long as states have nuclear weapons, other states will also want to acquire them. And uh, the attempts by all of us through the treaty regimes and through the excellent work done by the International Atomic Energy Agency will be set to naught. Today, there is an additional danger, and that is the problem of non-state actors or terrorists wishing to acquire weapons of mass destruction and almost certainly wanting to use them if they do acquire them. We have had the unsafe custody of uh, weapons of mass destruction in many countries, particularly after the end of the Soviet Union. And the excellent work done by Senators Nunn and Luga in the Cooperative Threat Initiative has to a large extent controlled that. But there are other countries where the custody of uh, nuclear material and weapons of mass destruction are not as secure as they should be. I must, at this point of time, mention that there is a Swedish government initiative to have a weapons of mass destruction commission chaired by Dr. Hans Blix. The report of that commission will come out in May of this year. And I'm hopeful that that commission will have certain recommendations which the international community will be called upon to act. I believe that we have had the abolition of biological weapons through the Biological Weapons Convention, although we do not have a verification mechanism for it. We have had the abolition of the chemical weapons which were used horrendously in World War I, and there is now an organization to verify and to supervise the implementation of that convention. But we still do not have a 
convention with regard to even the regulation of nuclear weapons. And I think this is a long felt need because we do know that even 27,000 uh, nuclear warheads is far too many for the deterrent value that it is supposed to have. And therefore, I think we need to address these issues. We need to once again inject a sense of urgency with regard to weapons of mass destruction in the world. But there are other categories of arms. Conventional weapons also kill, and some of them have lethal aspects which are much um, worse than ever before. Small arms today are perhaps the biggest killers. And uh, we are going to have a major conference in the summer of this year, which will help to control the problem of small arms. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Mr. Gupta, uh, the members of the United Nations are always expecting a lot from the institution. They want the organization to prevent conflict, to resolve conflict, to promote uh, development, to protect uh, human rights, to have an impeccable administration. And yet, there is always the feeling, for good reason, that the country members don't give the institution enough resources. And I'm not talking, I'm not talking about only financial resources. I'm talking about uh, political, uh, legal resources uh, to do its job. Uh, what is going to solve uh, this uh, contradiction? To have an institution created by the international community, uh, charged with uh, significant responsibilities, but not empowered to deliver uh, those uh, responsibilities? Well, let me... Uh First, start by saying I've had the privilege to uh, get to know the Secretary General in the last few months, uh, working with him on UN reform. And a quick story, we spent uh, last Thursday afternoon several hours working on it. And uh, when he saw me uh, here, he said, what happened? I said, it's dangerous to your health to work on UN reform. And this is what happened to me. But then he uh, went on to relay his story about his own injury last year, and uh, he is, uh, I must say, it's been a great privilege to work with him, and we will uh, next year, I'm sure, solely miss his leadership. But he also said at that that he is determined to uh, do the reforms that are necessary this year. To answer your specific question, let me just uh, give you three points that I have picked up in sort of traveling around the UN and the Secretariat and what it does and so on. The first thing is, is really probably the most important one, which is 60 years ago when it was created, it was the apex of public service, of international diplomat diplomacy, of a international civil service. Unfortunately, over time, it has not been able to attract the same caliber of people with the same vigor, young people coming into the organization, and so on. This is not, I don't mean by any means to say that the work they're doing is any less, uh, they have made tremendous successes. But one of the important things is to reform the human resource systems in the United Nations so the Secretary General has the freedom to allocate resources what's there in the way that is appropriate to move them around, to attract the right talent, and to create that kind of pool of resources. That was the first observation I'll make. Second one is it is extraordinary what the, the UN has been asked to do. It has expanded in the last 60 years with very important mandates that all of us have spoken about. The Secretary General just spoke about it. But if you look at the capacity at the top, I mean, I look at the Secretary General in no other institution that, you know, he's supposed to play the role of the chief diplomat to solve very thorny diplomatic issues while at the same time he is the chief administrator of a vast global network of human resources, et cetera. On top of that, he's got probably 25 people reporting to him directly and many others. This is not 
a job that is doable, and the capacity at the top really needs to be expanded. And we owe it to ourselves to, to give the second of that kind of resources to be able to do that. The last point I'd make is that the interaction between member states and the Secretariat, the Secretary General, there is something that has gone wrong over the years. The original charter was wonderful. Whatever model you believe in, whether it's a legislature, executive model, whether it's a shareholder, you know, operating model, no matter what model you believe in, the current interaction between the member states and the General Assembly, its subcommittees like the Fifth Committee, its micromanagement of every aspect of the operating uh, philosophy of the, and of the United Nations, and it is, you know, in, in a, it has gone to such a level. I don't think the Founding Fathers intended it. I don't think it's a, a you know, system that can operate that way. It really does need to be dialed back. And I would say to the member states, we really need to step back and look at it. Obviously, in order to have that level of trust and delegation, one needs to earn the trust back of the, the UN doing its job, and it is worthy of that trust. And I think the Secretary General has told me that he is very much prepared for a comprehensive package of reform that he's going to talk about in March with the General Assembly, and it will hopefully contain all of these elements. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, Madam President, the ultimate uh, institution of enforcement that the United Nations uh, was given is the Security Council. Can the United Nations uh, perform its core function, uh, which has to do with uh, peace and security, without a reform Security Council? As we know, the attempt to reform the Security Council also failed at the World Summit. What will it take to reform the Security Council? Is it reformable at all? The issue of the Security Council has been on the table for a very long time, and dissatisfaction with it uh, has been long-standing. At the same time, we must realize that the United Nations has been growing, and that having grown now to 191 members in the General Assembly, it's clear uh, that it needs a governing body uh, that takes serious decisions that does not encompass the whole General Assembly. But I'd like to, to start out by reminding everyone that 60 years have passed since the creation of this organization, and the world, post-war, Second World War, the world at the time was a different place from today. Over the years, new member states have been joining the family of nations, more and more flagpoles had to be put up uh, in front of the United Nations building. And uh, my country was one of the last to be in that number to see the flagpole raised there and the flag raised. And I appreciate it, particularly as representative of one of those countries that only gained its seat after the collapse of the Soviet Union, how important it is to have a world political forum of sovereign independent states who can come together, have a place to talk to each other, and to try and come to common viewpoints on the issues facing humanity. The mandate of sovereign states actually being responsible for what happens at the United Nations has indeed been expanding, and I think here Secretary General Kofi Annan has done marvels in convincing the world that the corporate world, World Economic Forum, the thoughts, the ideas that they can generate are important for the United Nations. That non-governmental go organizations have an important say. In other words, not just governments represent the peoples and the nations of the world, but many other institutions. And they all have to be canvassed. We have to get the synergy uh, of all those resources 
to have an input into what the United Nations can do for the world and for the planet as a whole. But when you look at the, the governance of this institution, yes, I completely agree with the diagnosis about the expectations that are placed on the Secretary General, uh, but not the tools uh, to operate with the kind of freedom his responsibility really requires. I think in many ways uh, the ability to act has been seriously shackled by this micromanagement and the desire of member states and members of the Assembly General to intervene with their particular point of view on issues that should have been delegated and uh, let the uh, Secretariat continue on with them. But the privileges of the Security Council are so enormous, the power that they yield uh, is so tremendous that it's very difficult for us mere mortals uh, to conceive of a time when they would willingly abandon them. I don't know what your experience is in your life uh, contacts, but I, I have not uh, witnessed many cases of the possession of power being given over gladly and willingly uh, without a certain amount of pressure. Uh, even I'm not talking about just revolutions and, and uprisings of the people and changes of the government, but in any situation where somebody has power, to wrest that power away from them uh, is quite a challenge. But the United Nations is made up of 191 members. We have five permanent members in the Security Council. We have at least now a number of rotating ones who get a chance to sit there where the serious decisions are taken. But we still have five who have the veto. And without their say-so, nothing will move. And this is something that we have to examine very seriously indeed. Uh, is it really proper to have five have such an important say compared to the others? And if so, are these the right five? Would you like to add or subtract some from them? That's a serious question. Clearly, for the five who sit there, they're quite content. Uh, for the others who sit on the outer ring, they're happy to be there for a while. But for the, for the outer ring who wait their turn, and many countries who really are serious donors, uh, to the United Nations, like the Netherlands and others, uh, look with alarm on the, on the chances of ever sitting on the Security Council uh, as the years roll by, uh, and, uh, and simply it does not happen. So that I think that the, if you like, the tiers and the levels of governance in the United Nations, eventually, I think, will have to break down and face up to it and say, really, we should rethink them uh, and be ready to think radical reforms. But as it is, I think the reforms put forth by the Secretary General are serious, they're, they're deep, and they need our support. Uh, one last thing I'd like to address is the fact that the public that the United Nations represents is one that is not best served always by their represented governments who sit there at the table. They are not always even elected governments or not freely elected governments. We also find that we have different ways of looking at things and issues. We had, and this was another initiative of the Secretary General, the Dialogue of Civilizations at the Millennium Summit. It was a crucial initiative where we faced up to the fact that different parts of the world do differ and differ deeply in their values. But it's a task of the United Nations is to come together and overcome these differences and come with a short list of issues that we all can subscribe to and that we're ready to support and we're ready to put the mechanisms in place to make them work. And I think one of the things that this will have to include is an acceptance of the fact that half of the world's population are women and that they have been very seriously under, underrepresented in both the governance and in the other bodies of the United Nations. Thank you, Madam President. Well, it's uh, about time to receive uh, a few questions. 
short questions from the public and, and give uh, very short uh, answers. Who wants to pose a question? Please. Um, my name is Edith Lettera, and I'm the Associated Press Bureau Chief at the United Nations. Um, I was, it's been alluded to here, of course, that, uh, that some of you might be interested in being the next Secretary General. Um, in the panel. The panel, yes. Yeah. We're, we're ex <laughs> the panel. Um, I was wondering, um, what you would see as your top priorities, maybe your top two or three priorities, if on January 1st, 2007, any of you became the, sec the next Secretary General of the United Nations? Well, the question is not for Gupta, not for me. Uh, any other <laughs> three that <laughs> Mr. Minister, do you want to answer? I understand this is a purely according to alphabetical order. <laughs> uh, I think uh, with the 60 years in existence of the United Nations and with the globalization uh, process deepening, it is high time now that the United Nations should uh, change itself, adapt itself to uh, effectively uh, uh, cope with all these uh, challenges, traditional and uh, non-traditional. For that matter, it is uh, very much urgently required that United Nations should uh, go through this uh, reform process as Secretary General and uh, all other panelists have pointed out. That uh, first of all, uh, I think uh, I would like to approach this in three aspects. One is uh, culture. I think we need to change this mindset of uh, the secretariat as well as the member states. I think both member state and management uh, secretariat are both responsible to change this mindset of this, uh, to have a stronger sense of ownership and more sense of uh, responsibility. And we have also made some institutional reforms like uh, the creation of PBC and uh, Human Rights Council. And we need to talk about more strengthening the uh, revitalizing General Assembly as well as uh, reform of the Security Council. Now, there are many hundreds, hundreds of decisions and resolutions which have taken during the last uh, maybe 50, 60 years, which some of them have been implemented, but not yet. Uh, those Re decisions and resolutions should be re-evaluated according to priority. So we need to have some prioritization of these uh, mandates. That is what we now call the uh, mandate review. Now there is a very serious problem of managerial uh, management reform. I think uh, we should ensure the highest standard of professional efficiencies and highest standard of ethics of secretariat officials. And in that regard, the Secretary General has already established ethics office and some other oversight uh, machineries that is uh, very much a welcome uh, decision. And in that regard, one thing I would like to emphasize is that it would be uh, desirable and important if we can introduce and uh, use some best practices of the public and private sectors who have been leading in innovation and re reforms in every sector of their uh, organizations. Thank you. Thank you. Well, what about Ambassador Ganapala? Well, like um, uh, Minister Ban, I also believe that uh, reform is certainly the priority item on the agenda. As the Secretary General has said, reform is not an event, it is a process. There are some aspects of reform that are clearly within the purview of the member states who are the 
major stakeholders in the UN system. And that involves institutional reform, reforms of obsolete institutions, dysfunctional institutions, and the need for being innovative with the institutions such as the Peace Building Commission. There are also programs that are obsolete, dysfunctional, and the need for new programs. But these uh, reforms have then finally to be implemented by the Secretariat, which has to deliver on reforms. And that is where management reform of the Secretariat itself, which should be the province of the Secretary General, comes in. Now, reforms must be fair and equitable. We need to also ensure that uh, there are a number of guidelines, such as uh, geographical representation, gender representation, in addition, of course, to the highest criteria with regard to merit and uh, efficiency. We can adopt a number of business practices, and this has been recommended uh, by the uh, US report on uh, UN reform by uh, George Mitchell and uh, Newt Gingrich. I think there, are, there is a lot in that that could be looked at. But beyond this, I would say, coming from a developing country myself, there is a very serious need for us to address the North-South issue. We have, during the last 60 years, seen the end of the Cold War and the East-West uh, dispute. We do not want that to be replaced by a North-South hiatus. And the achievement of the Millennium Development Goals are crucial towards satisfying the aspirations of the South. We do need to have poverty reduced and eliminated. We do need to ensure that the disease, the famine, and other problems uh, in the South are addressed. And this will involve vast resources from the North, which I believe we can uh, really mobilize. The way in which the world responded to the tsunami and the way in which my own country benefited from this spontaneous generosity of the people, which often outstripped the generosity of the governments themselves, I think is symbolic of what can be done if the people are left to themselves. Thank you, Madam President. I think the problems that uh, the world will be facing on the 1st of January 2007 are likely uh, to be much the same ones, one hopes, uh, that they are today. And therefore, the main responsibility of the United Nations is to intervene when there are humanitarian crises in the world, and, uh, and to do so as rapidly and as efficiently as possible. Uh, at the moment, we have a number of these going on. The tsunami was a force of nature, an act of God, and uh, the reactions to these usually are swift uh, and efficient, but the damage, of course, is great. Uh, when there is our acts of man uh, that are responsible, as we are now seeing in Darfur, uh, the reaction is not nearly as swift and not nearly as efficient. But the damage is still great, and it continues every day that we sit there and do nothing it gets worse and the number of victims increases. I think the mobilization, the capability to mobilize of the United Nations, its capability to call in, be it regional or national resources, uh, is crucial. And I'm sure and afraid uh, that in the years to come, we will continue to have crises of that sort. Development remains a top priority. Uh, this is why the contact in uh, fora such as the World Economic Forum are so important uh, because this North-South dialogue has been one of the themes of the World Economic uh, Council, uh, Forum here for a number of years. Uh, the Millennium Goals uh, pursue the same direction. It is something that has to be addressed, and we have to do it quickly, and we have to do it efficiently. We cannot wait around. And all the other questions then uh, become subsumed to it, and they are already being addressed by a variety of bodies, such as the World Health Organization, and so on and so forth. But I do agree that there is a lot of overlap. There is a tremendous amount of overlap uh, between the activities and uh, bodies of the United Nations themselves. Uh, there are non-governmental uh, bodies, there are foundations, private foundations, uh, corporate owners, 
Uh, frequently, they overlap, and the coordination effort here has to continue and become more and more efficient without infringing on the rights of anybody to decide where they want to put their money. It's, after all, uh, the donor's privilege, but at the same time, uh, to get a better coordination between the donors and the recipients and to ensure uh, that what is being spent is being spent, uh, invested uh, in the future and will bear fruit uh, for a long time to come. Thank you, Madam President. Well, I think we have run out of time. Let me thank uh, our panelists. Let me thank uh, very especially uh, Mr. Secretary General and pay my personal tribute to his work, to his courage, to his leadership. And just uh, let me conclude by saying that uh, after listening to all these uh, presentations, uh, my feeling is that uh, there is not, uh, there isn't going to be a big bang of reform of the United Nations. We will continue to see incremental changes. I think uh, the pressure has to continue uh, on those that have the responsibility to lead for change, uh, the big players in the international geopolitical game. The pressure has to be put on also on the naysayers that uh, never contribute uh, positively, but obstruct uh, whatever proposal is made uh, on the table. But uh, the most important thing is not uh, to give up. I think uh, the reform must be completed. It must be an ongoing uh, process, uh, but it must be a speed up because there is uh, urgency. We better fix the system before uh, the future is here. And it can be a very bad future if we don't have the right uh, institutions to confront uh, that situation. I think it is better to reform the system as a creative imperative, as we are saying these days here, rather than as a result of creative destruction. Creative destruction works uh, in the business world, but uh, on issues of peace, poverty, human rights, there is no such a thing as a creative destruction. Thank you very much. Thank you.